about the cross, and he says, Now my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. The purpose of the incarnation, the purpose of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ was to be crucified. And even though it was in the divine purpose of God to be crucified, even though he is the Logos of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, he was so troubled by the cross. And he was troubled for several reasons, which I will share. Number one, our Lord was troubled because... He knew the torture that he would have to endure on the cross. He, he understood the ridicule, the shame, and the cross was the worst form of humiliation, the worst form of humiliation. Even St. John Chrysostom, he writes something really shocking. He says, his human nature appears, a nature that did not wish to die. Anybody wish to die? He says, the Lord did not wish to die, but cleaved to this present life. He says, Christ is not without human feelings. He is not without human feelings. For the desire of this present life is not necessarily wrong any more than hunger. He says, was Christ hungry? Was he thirsty? Did he want to stay alive? Like he was pained by the thought of death, just as anyone would be pained by the thought of death. Because this is the Son of God, and he, like, that death didn't mean anything to him. No, it meant the same, like it would mean to any of us. He knows how difficult, like, it would be to give a life. But our Lord Jesus Christ, he commanded us in the gospel. He said, whoever desires to save his life, he will lose it. But whoever loses his life, for my sake, will find it. And our Lord Jesus Christ, when he teaches, or when he taught, he was not speaking metaphorically. And he never gave us a commandment that he didn't keep himself. And so, St. John Chrysostom, he says, However you may be troubled and dejected at the thought of dying, he says, do not run away from death. Do not run away from death. He says, Jesus was troubled, yet he did not ask to be spared. He did not ask to be spared. And I think our Lord, you might say, Abuna, no one's killing me. But I would say, the Lord is teaching us not to run from our problems. Not to run from our problems. The apostles didn't run from their problems. You know, when they came to arrest the Lord Jesus Christ, it's, it's written that they called out for Jesus of Nazareth, and he said, I am he. He didn't, all the disciples, they got panicked. And, and actually it says they fell back, the, 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 the soldiers. They were the ones scared. And they said, and he said, who are you seeking? He said, I am he. The Lord wanted to show us not to be scared, not to be scared, not to run away from our problems. Don't let anxiety or things, that, the fear of this world, ruin, like challenge us and keep us and hold us down. In Acts chapter 21, we read about a prophet named Agabus who prophesied about the death of St. Paul. And he took a belt and he, he tied himself and, and said, whoever owns this belt, you know, will be, is going to receive the same, uh, the same circumstance. And it says that when St. Paul saw this, he said, now when he heard these things, they pleaded with him not to go to Jerusalem. They said, St. Paul, why are you going to go to Jerusalem to die? And I think St. Paul, he knew this. He understood what I was just speaking about. He said, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? He said, for I am ready not only be to, ba to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. I'm sure St. Paul, he felt troubled. I'm sure he felt troubled. But St. Paul, he embraced his cross. He embraced his cross. Some people, they try to bury their problems. They try to bury their problems, or they never address their problems. And I'm talking about problems like the way God made us. Like, there's some things like God made us this way. You can't run from it. 
Everything else that you can, like if you have a bad friend, run away from those things. I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about things that are in like our nature. Don't like you. Ca you have to address these problems. Don't be scared of these problems. Embrace them as the Lord embraced the cross, as Saint Paul embraced his cross. Number two, our Lord was troubled because the cross was Satan's manipulation of people. The cross was Satan's manipulation of people. In John 13, it says that after the Lord dipped the bread at the Last Supper, he gave it to Judas. And it says that after he, Judas received this piece of bread, it says Satan entered him. Satan entered him. When the Lord was being questioned during his trial... They asked him about the doctrine and all these questions. He said, I was with you daily in the temple and you did not seize me or try to seize me. But this is your hour. This is your time. And he said, this is the power of darkness. This is the power of darkness. The crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ, this was the power of darkness. And our Lord was troubled because he knew of the depravity of man. He knew how man was bloodthirsty, bloodthirsty. He knew how man did not seek true justice, but rather can condemn an innocent one. Our Lord was troubled because he was proclaiming truth, but mankind pref preferred to believe lies. Mankind preferred to believe lies. And unfortunately, mankind likes to follow his own, like our own gospel. We love to follow our own gospel. The Pharisees, they had their own understanding of the law. And I think sometimes we have our own understanding of what the Bible is teaching to us. Unfortunately, the Pharisees' understanding was incorrect. It was not based on truth. And that's why the Lord, he had a big problem with the Pharisees. They lacked mercy. They lacked love. That's why St. Paul, he says in his epistle, he says, they will heap up for themselves teachers. They will heap up for themselves teachers and will turn their ears away from truth and be turned aside to fables. It reminded me of what we read this morning, actually, in the wisdom of Solomon. Actually, it sounds very like I can imagine a teenager saying the same words. Hear this and see if you hear what like a teenager's voice in this. Righteous people are nothing but a nuisance. So let's look for chances to get rid of them. They are against what we do. They accuse us of breaking the law of Moses and violating the tra tradition of our ancestors. They claim to know God and they call themselves the Lord's children. We can't stand the sight of people like that. What they are contradicts our whole way of thinking. They are not like other people. They are not like other people. They have strange ways. They have st are, the way our parents, they're so strange. They have strange ways. They think that our moral standards are so corrupt that everything we do should be avoided. They boast of having God for their father and believe that when all is said and done, only the righteous will be happy. Isn't that what we tell our kids and our kids? Are, oh, shh, shh. I want us to be people hungry for the truth. Are we hungry for the truth? Or are we ready to crucify those who speak the truth? It reminds me in John chapter 7, it speaks about the Lord Jesus Christ preaching in the temple. And actually they were talking about the doctrine. And in the last day, it says on the last day when Jesus was teaching, he like stood up and he said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Are you thirsty for the truth? 
Are you thirsty to know what God is teaching for the truth of the gospel? Otherwise, we'll be just like the people who crucified the Lord. Number three, our Lord was troubled because he was soon to be abandoned by his closest friends. He was even abandoned by his closest disciples. He was even abandoned by all those whom he healed. I was reading a, a commentary by Abuna Manasa Yohanna. I really recommend uh, his book, The Crucified Jesus. He asked a very interesting question. He said, where's the blind man? He said, where's the paralytic man? He said, where's Nicodemus? He said, where are the 5,000 men that the Lord Jesus Christ fed? Where are they? 5,000 men. And on another occasion, another 4,000 men. And then when they called for witnesses, there was not one to witness for the Lord. Not one. Not one. Not one to say he did a miracle for me. And you know, the gospel says that if you wrote all the miracles, even all the books in the world could not contain it. Where are all these people? But he was abandoned. The Lord Jesus Christ was abandoned. Abuna Manasseh, he goes on to say that even the disciples, the worst was the disciples. The Lord went to the disciples and said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. My soul is exceedingly sorrowful. And then, and then he goes to pray. And then what do the disciples do? They mean sleep. And then he came back again and said, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray. And then guess what? They fell asleep again. <laughs> And he rebuked them. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So all of us during this time, we need to, we need to strengthen our flesh. We need to strengthen our flesh. The good news for us is that these disciples, yes, their spirit was willing and their flesh was weak. But guess what? Their flesh did not stay weak. It was weak now, like on the eve of the crucifixion, it was weak. But it was not, they did not stay weak. Like St. Peter at the end of his life, would you say his flesh was weak? He was crucified upside down. And all the other disciples, all of them, aside from St. John, were martyred. Their flesh did not stay weak. All of us, we need to be growing in our spiritual life. We make the flesh strong by actually weakening the body. We make the flesh strong through fasting, through fasting. We make the flesh strong through keeping vigil. Actually, there's something very interesting in this, this garden. I actually need to do more research on this, but into you can, if you're awake, you can do this, this research and let me know what you find. Is that the third time when the Lord Jesus Christ came to ask the disciples, you know, if they were sleeping. In old translations, it says that the Lord said, it's okay, stay sleeping. Stay sleeping. And I don't think he was saying it, like, sarcastically. Like, stay sleeping. And then, because he, then he said, arise, my betrayer is at hand. Like in, in some translation, it, it took the form of a question. Are, we, are you still sleeping? In some translations, it's like, stay sleep, please stay sleeping. And I was thinking about this, why it would like contain this mystery, like stay sleeping. Why would the Lord tell them to stay sleeping? And I thought, these are just some thoughts, is that it shows us the power of prayer. It shows us that there is a time for prayer. It shows us that there is a time for prayer. Like, and I was always, I'm thinking, how would have St. Peter been different if he prayed that night? Would he still have betrayed? I don't know. 
But I'm wondering if, his, if he was able to keep vigil, if he was able to ask God, could his outcome would have been different, like would his outcome been different? Another meditation was that there is a time for prayer and there is a time to rest. And the Lord wanted to say, this is the time for prayer. Now rest and trust in God's action. So I think this is very like, like comforting to us. Make use of the time of prayer. If you are in trouble, make use of the time of prayer. And then there is a time to rest and let God take, take action. Lastly, the Lord was most troubled by the thought or by the weight of sin that he was about to carry on the cross. Actually, Abuna Manasa, he talks about this in the book. He talks about how no man can bear their own sins. And if you look in the scripture, for example, David in the Psalms, he says, my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My iniquities are too heavy for me. And you remember when Cain killed Abel, Cain, he said something to God. He said, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Now, this is only one man's sin. If one man's sin is too much of a burden for, for someone, can you imagine now the sins of all the past, of the present and the future, now like concentrated in one point and put on the Lord Jesus Christ? This was such a heavy burden on the Lord Jesus Christ. And actually, Abuna Manasseh, he contemplates on the, th the crown of thorns. He says all those th sins are like the crown of thorns that were placed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know how painful the crown of thorns must have been, like right in the temple area of the brain and all the nerves and he took that crown of thorns and it was lodged on his, on his forehead. And thorns from the beginning of time were always a symbol of sin. When mankind fell in sin, when mankind fell in sin, the Lord said, now out of thorns you will eat the bread. So these thorns were all placed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet in the midst of all of this trouble, there is glory. There is glory. And even our Lord Jesus Christ, when he said, my soul is troubled, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. The next verse after that says, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. St. Paul in Corinthians, he shows us the glory of the cross. He says, therefore, we never lose heart. He says, we never lose heart. Even though the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by The new inward man is getting renewed day by day. For our light affliction is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. For things which are seen are temporary, but things which are not seen are eternal. The glory of the cross is that he turned death to life. He turned death to to give life. He said, as a seed goes into the ground, if it must, it dies, it can bear no fruit. This was the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He transformed death to life. We'll talk more about that, God willing, tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Number two, the glory from the cross is healing from the cross. Healing from the cross. This verse has been on my heart a lot. He says, he himself bore our sins in his body on a tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. 
And I was thinking, do you remember what the first sin of man was? The first sin of man was to become gods. They wanted to become gods. They wanted to be greater than God. And this has what I was telling you earlier, when we want to believe our own truth, when we want to do things according to our own will, this is to become your own God. St. Peter says, no, we need to die to sin, die to this pride to become your own God. Listen to what God wants to do for you, do his will. But then he said, by his wounds you have been, by his wounds you have been healed. You guys know that the cross in the Old Testament, one of the most famous symbols of the cross is the bronze serpent, the bronze serpent. And you know in the Old Testament when the people of Israel, they grumbled against God, he sent to them poisonous snakes and these poisonous snakes and Israel was about to perish. And they cried out to Moses and Moses made from them a bronze serpent and the beautiful thing about this serpent was, is that if they just, all they had to do to be healed was to, just to look at the bronze serpent and they would be healed. They would be healed. If we look at the cross, we can be healed. We know that this serpent is like the cross. But this serpent is so, always troubled me because the serpent is kind of a, when you think of a serpent, you think of like Satan. So why do they look at like a bronze serpent and they were healed? And actually, there's a great mystery to this bronze serpent. The serpent itself was poisonous and it caused death. But the bronze serpent, is it poisonous or is it not poisonous? It was just like the other snakes, but this snake was without poison. Similarly, we said that mankind, I told you earlier, so evil, doesn't want to hear truth, so poisonous. And then there was one who came in, in the flesh, but no poison. And this one without poison was hung on the wood of the cross. And if we look at this one without poison, free from sin, we will be healed. Actually, this is what St. Paul, he says. He says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us that we may become the righteousness of God. He took the form of sinful flesh except without sin and gave us healing. Look to the cross and we can have healing. Lastly, one of the things that we learn from the cross, the important, one of the, the greatest lessons we can learn from the cross is actually we read it in, the, Philipp in the, uh, the Pauline epistle that was just read. It was from Philippians. It is service. The cross teaches us service, teaches us service. St. Paul, he says in Philippians, he says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. He says, let nothing be done out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let, is, let each one esteem others better than himself. He says, let not each one of you look out for only your own interests but also the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, coming in the likeness of men, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And then he says, hear this part, and being found in appearance as a man, this is why it's, it's it's, we read this today. He says, therefore he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. 
Therefore, Godly has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. The cross teaches us service. The cross teaches us love. St. John, in his epistle, it's actually very easy to remember. The most famous verse in the Bible is 1 John, or I just gave you the answer. No, John 3.16. 3.16, and in 1 John 3.16 is also like an amazing verse, so you can remember it, huh? 1 John 3.16. 1 John 3.16, he says, St. <coughs> John, he says, by this we know love, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, we also ought to lay down our life for our brethren, Wow. Because he has laid his life down for us, we should lay down our life for our brethren. <laughs> lay our life down. Ah, now we struggle to give a brethren 10 minutes of our time. <laughs> what do you mean, St. John, lay our life down? But this is the message of the cross. The message of the cross is that greater love has no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. This is how we know we have passed from death to life. This is how we know we have passed from death to life. Actually, St. John, he says, we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. In death, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. My brothers, sisters, I wonder, do we lay down our life for our, our friends? Do we give anything? Are we giving people? Are we nurturing people? The cross teaches us to be giving. I see this as one of the greatest lessons. The cross is all about love. And our Lord on the cross, he told us to love one another. He forgave those who, who crucified him. We should forgive those who do, do us harm. Do not hold bitterness or resentment in your heart. Give it away. Give it away. Love one another. And glory be to God forever. Amen.